spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. Max and Mike, pelted by gamma rays, turn into your hosts. Ain't they unglamour rays? <laughs> Superhero, wow! We are in for one Excelsior rockin' show. This week, our special guests include Warpath, Sunspot, Kitty Pride, sorta, kinda, Blink, Bishop, no, not the one from Aliens, and, well, a whole passel of mutant muckers who never nabbed a Nate, and Slang. We forgot how much we hate time travel is the series, and X-Men Days of Future Past is the movie on this week's show. Time travel and muties, how can they go wrong? Well, we're gonna tell you. Or are we? Snicked, everybody! Over there in the penalty box, because he is one bad brother, hood of evil mutants, is everyone's <laughs> favorite slang, and, well, he sure is mine, Max Nito Levine. Monologue for us, Max. Uh, we are actually the best there is at what we do, and what we do isn't very, well, it's a thing we do, but we do it the best. We are the best at what we do, and never mind what it is. And speaking of that, ruining my next line, I, who am over here saying this, am the best at what he does, best <laughs> oh, at which oops. is besting everyone, make mine Mike loose. <laughs> ah, well, these things happen. Together, Sorry. we are Hammer and Anvil! <laughs> you know, if Hammer dies, Anvil die. Uh, Tomax and Zaymot? Oh, no, no. Well, okay, but I call Zaymot. Laverne and Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, anyway, we had a poll question that you had answered, uh, so let's get to that, shall we? <laughs> Before I hurt I again. We, <laughs> we asked, if you had a time machine, what would you do with it? The question was provided by one of our listeners, Haley, so thank you for that. Don't forget, you can give us suggestions, too, and earn an extra bumpy bucks, the fake currency that's soon to be accepted in a major South American country. Or never. Your answers were both <laughs> kind of goofy and somewhat deep. Matt Reisman gave us, quote, I'd travel to times when important historical te texts or objects were lost and recover them, which, if time travel works, is probably why they're lost, end quote. Eh, makes sense to me. I'd want to see that mm. library. Yeah. Next up, Tyler Stewart posted, quote, Can we change history or not? If we can't, then going to the Library of Alexandria with a camera, capturing and bringing back breeding pairs of extinct animals, etc., are on the table. If we can, I'd play it safe and only mess with the last 30 to 40 years, giving a younger me some excellent advice, preventing various tragedies, etc. Going further back risks my own existence, end quote. I'd say mm, that taking point. breeding pairs would in some small way change the past, but okay, thanks, Tyler. Ah, that's real interesting. Uh, we have Val, not at all my sister except when she is Coons, with, quote, I'm confused. Your website has a different poll question. End quote. Uh, and, yes, sorry <laughs> about that, folks. That was on me. And you know, she's right. So four poll bucks for her. That's a word. <laughs> Chuck Mock answered with, quote, had one, did that. Talking about it will have messed up the continuum again. <laughs> End quote. Good answer. <laughs> Which means our show is a huge hit. In the future. I'm sure yes, that's what it that's means. that's right. Yeah, that's what it means. Dave gives himself away with, quote, I would become a secret ninja time assassin, of course, <laughs> end quote. Dave, we'll be looking for you now. Ah! Yep. <laughs> Damn you, Dave. Where did these shuriken in my arm come from? <laughs> these throwing Ow! things are delicious. Uh, <laughs> on a more sober note, Nick Hoffman said, quote, I would honestly want to see if we survive long term, and if so, how, end quote. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea, and yeah. kind of ties, ties into this week's movie. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to know. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting, he's so far the only one who talked about going to the future as opposed yeah. to going to the past. Yeah. Back in the wait a minute category, Kelly Cooper replied, quote, I'd turn it on and wait for the time police to show up, end quote. <laughs> well, I'd hate to argue that ticket. Har. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Loki comes and uh, hands it to you. That I actually, you know, I, that might be worth it. <laughs> I don't know. Matthew McConaughey show, or not Mike McConaughey, what's it? Owen Wilson shows up. Uh, <laughs> I'm still going to vote with, uh, with uh, Loki, because it's like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't read this with your shirt on. That's just how it works. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Smart Alex are up next with Benjamin Javi Carl, who posits, quote, It depends on whether it's a time and space machine. Since Earth is moving at more than 60,000 miles per hour, a time-only machine would likely just drop you off in the vacuum of space. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. If it does both, I'd go to the future, make notes, and come back as a savvy but not too savvy investor. If I were evil, I'd binge new shows before they're released and then spoil them for people. <laughs> diabolical you <after>. monster. <laughs> yes, diabolical indeed, Javi. Wrecking shows for untold tens of people. Evil! <laughs> Val came back with, quote, I think I would leave it where it sits. It would be interesting to see the ancient past as it really happened, and I might do it if I would only be an observer and not able to interact or otherwise affect what has happened. I don't believe you could ever travel to the future as it hasn't happened yet, and all sorts of things could influence what actually happens. End quote. She has a point. Wait, what point? How should I know? She's French. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, anyway, thanks for answering. I don't have to ask, ask you, Max, because uh, we actually asked each other in uh, the beginning of the series what we do. And your answer, if I remember correctly, was destroy it. <laughs> yeah. Time tra- if time travel was possible, I wouldn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. If it was possible just for observation, yeah. uh, I kind of like Nick's idea of going back to the Library of Alexandria. That's Matt's. At, uh, Matt's, excuse yep. me. And, well, I wouldn't just take a camera. I'd just grab a whole crap load of books. Yeah. Because no one's going to miss them. I remember thinking, oh, it'd be neat to go back, say, to the the era when Jesus was supposed to be around. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but I don't speak ancient Hebrew or Latin or any of the languages. So I'd be walking around going, uh, donde esta el Cristo? Uh, <laughs> donde esta Jesus? <laughs> yeah, that would yeah, work. Kind of, of course, kind of, yeah. If you can't interact, nobody would hear you anyway, so... Uh, I, there was also a response that you may not have seen it, because I think it was sent to mine, oh. from uh, Susan, oh. who said she would use it to go back and speak to family members. Oh. Passed away. I gotta say, there are questions I'd like to ask my younger family members. If, they did, if I didn't know, they would just go, who the hell are you? Get away from me. Because <laughs> all of Max's family is from New York. <laughs> They are, actually. Oh, well, there you go. Anyway, uh, all of you did answer. You're all peaches, and you all get five copies of the Bumpy Hut catalog, the send-away for every day. The holidays are coming. (laughs) The holidays are coming. You'll want to order your St. Swithin's Day presents early for extra savings. (laughs) We have a new question this week, which you can answer by, well, that would be telling. And we will, later. But now... What film do you wish had really been a TV show instead? A nice, long, many-seasoned TV show. Let's get to the trivia, shall we? To the mic, mobile, old chum! And by that I mean, of course, Chopped Fish. The show. Trivia. One of the reasons this particular plotline was chosen was because it was seen as a way for the producers to fix any issues in the existing X-Men franchise's timeline. Good oh boy. Yeah, which it brilliantly did <clears throat> sure <clears throat> logan in the i didn't know this category as revealed by the young lady logan wakes up with in the past wolverine's full name is jimmy james logan jimmy a name that makes supervillains tremble with fear excuse me that is not his actual name his name is james Hazlitt. as anyone knows from the wolverine origins miniseries and as you will notice it says movie so, we are now kicking the comic sh- shop guy permanently hey, off hey, the show. <laughs> get, get away from me. Help! <laughs> and I hate to say it, but having been in the comic book industry and uh, working at a comic book store, having been to comic book conventions just for retailers, that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Matt Greening kind of nailed that. Yep. One of the biggest legal wranglings with the making of this movie comes from the character Quicksilver, as he was meant to be in both an Avengers film as well as an X-Men film. After much going back and forth, this secondary character was finally hashed out so that neither version would mention affiliation with either team in opposite movies. They wouldn't be played by the same actor. And finally, Disney bought Fox, which makes the whole (laughs) point moot. (laughs) Yeah. Why didn't we see more of Storm, possibly the coolest of the X-Men? Turns out Halle Berry was pregnant at the time of shooting. Okay, that would do it. Yeah, which, uh, good enough reason, but too bad, because, I mean, yeah. Halle Berry is great. I like her in just about anything, and Storm is really friggin' cool, so. Seriously, and the way they did her in the movies is is 
she was one of the most dead on characters. And I that made her eyes white out and everything when yep. she did storm yep. stuff. She was so cool. It's a very cool. Anna Paquin as Rogue is seen on screen for exactly <laughs> three seconds in this movie. Yeah. That's a waste. Yeah. Because that was another character I thought not exactly the same as in the comic book, but oh. really well done. Yeah, apparently there was some stuff shot with her, but it, they thought the plot was too complicated. They were right. And so they, they kept that were. part out. Yeah. Nope. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Strap in. As an explanation Ooh. for the codependent timelines in this movie, director Brian Singer stated that he relied on his understanding of string theory, which states, according to him, that, quote, until an object is observed, it hasn't happened yet. The time traveler whose consciousness travels through time, I call the observer, not the watcher, and until the observer returns to where he traveled from, the result hasn't occurred yet. So he can muck about in the past, and it isn't until he snaps back that the new future is set. End quote. We'll be okay. talking more about this later, Mr. Singer. See me after class. <laughs> First class, that is. This film earned the first Oscar nomination for an X-Men movie. For visual effects, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the original comic from which this was stole, uh, based, it was <laughs> Kitty Pride who traveled back in time, not Wolverine. But reasonably so, because of the way it's set, they figured if they sent her back to 1973, she would in fact have been minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No Stan Lee cameo in this one, folks. I... Think he was working on Stripperella. <laughs> <laughs> he likes that. I like Stripperella. Yeah. This is the fourth time Days of Future Past has been brought to a screen, big or small. The earlier three were animated versions. Eh. Trask's name, he's the villain in this film, more or less, is an anagram of Stark, a.k.a. Tony Iron Man. That's his real name. Gasp. <laughs> <laughs> Though he really is Quicksilver... No one calls Peter, wants Pietro Maximoff that. Kelsey Grammer really wanted to reprise his role as the Beast in this, but due to contractual obligations for his appearing in a Transformers movie, his part had oh, to be right. substantially cut and filmed separately. Yeah, down to one line. Yeah, and a wave. Ooh, I'm the Beast. And honestly, so much more that, oh, we just don't have time. Oh. So uh, let's get to the plot, shall we? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Deep breath. <sighs> yep, I, I have my scotch. I need you, scotch. I want you, scotch. All right. It's the far future, and the X-Men and other mutants we don't know and are never introduced to are in dire peril. These giant robot things are destroying them wherever they can, able to track them seemingly across the globe. While the few remaining rogue mutants are able to avoid capture and death, most are collared and kept in concentration camps. Or is it concentration bamps? I can't remember. <laughs> the future looks about as good as that provided by Skynet. But lo, the X-Men have a plan to send Wolverine back in time to 1973, to a point in time where the fate of mutant kind was decided in a political mess caused by Mystique, or Raven, depending on how you look at it. Wolverine's job is to stop her from killing Trask, a Stark-like scientist and weapons manufacturer, as her doing so causes the U.S. government to proceed with his plans to build the Sentinels, those giant killer robots, in the first place, which leads us back to the beginning of the movie. The big problem is that Wolverine can only fulfill his task with the help of Professor X and his arch-nemesis, Magneto. Or Cerebro. It? Cerebro, I... Magneto. Yeah. Cerebro. Magneto. <laughs> We meet a few new characters along the way, like Quicksilver, not at all twin to the Scarlet Witch of the Avengers movies, but sort of, kind of he is, mm -hmm. and a younger version of the Beast. Can our heroes come together in 1973 to not only beat Trask at his own game, but also keep the decision of making mutants an enemy of humans coming about? And can they do it in time? Stay tuned as we plunge headfirst into the mucky waters of both the Potomac and time travel, X-Men style! I applaud you for actually knowing the X-Men cartoon theme <laughs> and you. its lyrics. <laughs> yeah. I was always disappointed that uh, it didn't have lyrics like, you know, the Hulk or Iron Man or Captain America. Professor X, he's got no <laughs> legs. Professor X, he can't walk around or something like hey, that. Hey, Marvel, we just wrote your theme song for you. Come on. <laughs> yes, of course, except in this movie he can. But we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that. 
So uh, I, starting off, we have this battle scene, X-Men New Mutants. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> I reckon, okay, the nerd in me, yes. when I watch this scene, I'm sitting there going, okay, you know, there's Bishop, the guy with the energy absorption. There's Colossus. There's Blink, you know, who yeah, pretty obscure mutant. There's uh, now again nerd alert. <laughs> you Warbird was kind of the sequel to uh, the one of the first new of the new X Men, Thunderbird. You mean Warpath? Ju- uh, no, I mean Thunder. Oh, what did I say? You Warbird. Said Warbird. Yeah, that's right. Warbird was a villain. <laughs> yeah, Warpath was uh, the brother i think of john proudstar who was thunderbird who was and killed <laughs> off in like the first or second of the new x-men and i don't think they actually ever brought him back did they i don't know re- they bring everybody back i think he came back as i don't know Captain apache Chicken chief or something <laughs> yes oh god <laughs> that's it yeah and then, yeah we got Iceman, and we got mm. uh, i don't know who the flame guy was i thought he was sort of a combination of sunspot he and was magma. sunspot he was Sunspot? Yep. All right. Yeah, and I am guarantee that most people, the people who didn't read all the comics but yeah. like with the magnifying glass. No one's going to know. No, we have no idea who these people are. Oh, no, so-and-so died. Um, bad, bad, sadness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was sitting there going, okay, hey, there's Storm and Iceman and Kitty Pride, and who are you other people? Yeah. Uh, Kitty Again, Pride- it's 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 fan service. It's for, the, it's for, us, it's for us nerds. Yeah, I'm sorry, Kate. Is she, well, she was oh. in the comics. I don't think they actually call her Kate in this, but yeah. whatever. Uh, but yeah, later. so we have this big high stakes fight scene, which admittedly the fight scene's kind of cool, yeah. um, especially Blink when she's having things go in different directions. And it's obvious that these guys, like I love seeing Colossus at one point, he runs into one of her little teleportation um, things Portals, and yeah. then he's falling to gather speed and then she teleports him again so he's going laterally into one of the robots that was, that was a, of the, yeah that, that was, was very cool, cool. Uh, I, I, by the way i i like your i i'm right there with your comment about skynet because the first thing i see in the first scene when there's all the dead bodies and the ruin it's like ah skynet's been through here yeah do you notice how nobody was actually decomposing they were just dead yeah they were remarkably well preserved apparently yeah. they'd all been murdered that day yeah. And the one bad thing about this this you know future that we get a glimpse of is that we don't actually see anybody who's benefiting from this. Yeah, that's actually a point. Who is this it? I mean, so everyone is in a labor camp or or a concentration camp and or a concentration bamp. A concentration bamp. <laughs> Yes, I don't like the sound of these here concentration bamps. <laughs> Mr. Hilter. Yeah, uh, I gave him my baby to kiss, and, and he, he bit, bit it in the head. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, but of course, the idea the Sentinels aren't there to make things better for humanity. They're just there to hunt mutants. And well, apparently their programming never evolves. When we get to Trask, that is what the whole, his whole point is. That's his point. It doesn't appear to be theirs, and so, we don't know how that gets away from him. And Trask is a, I guess, misguided Tony Stark, or at least a very similar to pre-Iron Man Tony Stark, where it's like, I make weapons, except he's a little bit more aggressive about it. You get the idea that Tony Stark is like, yeah, I make weapons. (laughs) Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) Whatever. And this guy is like, no, I don't like this whole mutant thing because we're being threatened. And here's the thing. Trask, who's played really well by Peter Dinklage kind of has a point. Now, I don't yeah. think the point of let's kill everything that threatens me is a good idea, but if you've got these mutants, or as Marvel puts it, homo superior, which is, as he uh, he makes a little uh, analogy between uh, homo sapiens and oh, Neanderthals. He doesn't make the analogy. That's why it's so so uh, powerful. He's quoting Charles Xavier. He's right. quoting a paper saying how, oh yeah, this next evolutionary stage comes along and the previous one gets wiped out. And he's telling the Congress, look, we're the Neanderthals here. Yeah. If we let these guys develop, we're all dead. Yeah. Thank and you, you it, the thing that there are some very good points in this movie, and that to me is one of them, is the fear, the reasoning behind the villain. Even if you don't agree with it, you can see why they would think that way. And this is actually what makes a good villain is when you can see their point of view. Again, not necessarily agreeing with it, but when the villain actually has a side and it's not just, me kill because killing. Yeah, yeah. It actually, you're you're like, I get it. And other, the other cool thing is Peter Dinklage, for those who don't know, is a little person. They never make a mention of that in the film. It doesn't come up at all. It doesn't matter. 
but, and it fits because sorry yeah well, i was gonna say but you could see also why he might feel that way being a little person but it's not made a thing of and it's great they shouldn't and peter dinklage i i kept thinking when i first saw this like wow he does a pretty good american accent and it's like oh right he's not he British. is american <laughs> he's very american it's an interesting point too because technically dwarfism is a mutation mm -hmm. and he, he doesn't that doesn't come up and, and it's obvious it has nothing to do with anything because what he's there for is his brain he's super right. smart yeah and obviously the other thing that drove him e be, made, to become this sort of dark character is that his first name is Bolivar. <laughs> Bolivar Trask. How, how could you not become a bad guy if your first name is Bolivar? Well, I'm just guessing his parents never wanted him to be a cousin Bolivar. That's... <laughs> I think that must <laughs> or be Oliver. It. And, so they and added we do and... see... that That is... He is actually an interesting antagonist because you can't really call him a villain. He's certainly a lot less villainous than his comic book counterpart, who's basically, I hate all mutants, mutants evil, bad, murder, murder. <laughs> That's, by the way, a direct quote. Um, <laughs> he's, Thank he's, you, he's, But he's also, there's some really disturbing kind of Joseph Mengele echoes when you find out he's been experimenting on mutants and dissecting right. them and possibly vivis doing terrible things to them. And that he doesn't think of them as people, because he keeps referring, like when he's yelling about Mystique, he refers to her as it, right? not her. Right. She, he doesn't think they're people. And I, But again, you understand his fear, because when you see the X-Men fighting other villains, Los Mont... Uh, what is it? Los Malos Mutantes. <laughs> um, you are like, well, what would we do? Or actually, honestly, any Marvel superhero, or really any yeah. superhero, wow, they're throwing buildings again. Well, I hope I make it home. I hope there's a home when I get there. Because what are you supposed to do? Somebody can control fire. Somebody can turn themselves into solid steel. Somebody can teleport, make teleport well, holes in things. The biggest bad guy, the one who hates humans the most, Magneto, has controls one of the most powerful fundamental forces in the universe, electromagnetism. Yeah, and he and proves he, it. He just he can toss battleships around, and he does. Does um, he picks up for some reason a stadium? We'll get to that. That's yeah. kind. Of, I remember that looked cool, but I'm sitting going, that is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. But all right, yeah. The Sentinels, so they're a long-standing uh. villain for the Marvel Universe, mostly for the X-Men, because they were originally designed to attack the mutants. And the deal is very much like Ultron. As soon as you beat one, they would make a new series, and they get worse and worse and worse. But I gotta say, the ones that show up in the beginning of this film, which are the futuristic versions, are way worse than any Sentinels I remember. Oh, those are the ones they're based on. They actually mention this. You yep. see very quickly, they're looking through the plans, and you see the Nimrod model. And Nimrod, which apart, apart from being a kind of a dumb name, <laughs> was this super sentinel who was a compl an adapter and uh, was almost impossible to defeat. Yeah. So clearly these were all Nimrod sentinels, and that's why they were so dangerous. Right. They're and they basically, they can adapt by using the powers of the people they're fighting against them, transform oh, basically transforming themselves into the different mutants they're fighting, which they do. Yes, this also sounds like another Marvel villain, the super adaptoid, but whatever. Well, it also sounds like Rogue, right? Yeah, it sounds like a lot of people. It, yeah. Power duplication's a big trope in comic books. Uh, uh, the, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I will say, as a force to be reckoned with, I couldn't come up with a way to defeat them. Because yeah. I'm like, damn, uh, wait, what if you, oh, they did. Oh, 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 um, screwed. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. If there were a whole bunch of those models that, you, it's amazing that they were, any of them were still alive for as long as they were. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, the whole Sentinel thing is always difficult. You've seen a lot of variants of it. Yeah. One of the things I, I kind of like about, I liked about this movie is we get to see the two generations of, you know, Xavier Magneto in, in the, at the same time, in effect. We see Mac, James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender as young Charles and young Eric, mm -hmm. and we get Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. Yep. And, you know, honestly, if you've got uh, Sir Patrick and Sir Ian in anything, I'll watch it. I mean, yeah. it could be like a live-action Curious George. I don't care. Um because they're a lot of fun. Apparently, they were working on a play together at the time, and they were called up. It's like, uh, would you come and do this? Like, oh, I, I, I thought we weren't doing those. And whether you have younger <laughs> people to play us, um, yes, but we really want you for this. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll be right there. Uh, they're apparently very yeah. eager to do it. 
And this was very clearly, as you said in the uh, trivia, an attempt to shoehorn some kind of continuity into between the old X Men and you know uh, from the first three movies, three movies, right? Uh, yes, I. Yeah, think. the Brian Singer and the what's his name? Yeah, that uh, one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then the ones with your know, first class, mm-hmm. and uh, this and. Uh, and then Logan fits in here somehow, but somehow we, <laughs> Logan's down the road there, and then you have X Men Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. No, you don't. Nah, you really don't. <laughs> you really shouldn't have. Yeah, although there is a little teaser at the end of the credits for this. Yeah, but whatever. Yeah, there's an end credit teaser for Apocalypse. It really doesn't have much to do with the uh, the actual movie X Men Apocalypse, except the same characters in it. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, and one of the things that I really like is seeing future Charles, future Eric, and how they've actually learned to get along with each other, because that didn't seem likely. No. Um, And in fact, in 1973, when we see them trying to work together, it's really only Wolverine who has the memory of having seen them work together to convince them to work together, and of course, breaking Eric out of jail. Yeah, uh, I I had a problem with that. (laughs) Which part? For, okay, first of all, he's in jail for killing Kennedy. Right. Killing JFK. Apparently, he was. He claims he was trying to save him. Why? Because JFK was a mutant. Yeah. Sure. Do you know what his power was supposed to be? What? He made people like him. I thought it was the accent. Because <laughs> nobody, n- nobody, nobody talked with that sort of accent. Yeah, that is a Kennedy thing, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. No one else in New England talks that way. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that was weird. I also have to say, it's like, okay, we've got the most dangerous mutant terrorist in the world. He can literally throw buildings around. Let's put him under the Pentagon. <laughs> well, as opposed to in the middle of a desert in Utah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess they figured he was more being guarded this way. My thought was really, why are you keeping him alive? Yeah, why didn't you just execute him? Especially when you know he knows your secret, which, as it turns out, he didn't kill JFK. He was actually trying to prevent it, but they they took him out, but before he was able to do so. Um, so uh, you heard it here first, folks. It was yep. in fact a secret government plot to take out JFK, and it was because he was a mutant. Yep. And Brian Singer proved it. Um, I think, you know, I mean, we're talking about the characters, which, okay, we're both X-Men fans. We both geeked out when the new X-Men were out in the 80s, Max yep. before I did. He actually was a lo- much longer term X-Men reader than I was. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. this is the group of all of the groups at Marvel, I think, that people were dying to see done well most. And there are parts of the X-Men that are done well. Uh, there are parts of the X-Men that are very not done well. This particular plot line was actually one of the most popular plot yeah. lines, not least of which because it was only two issues. Thank the Lords. Uh, we're not looking at the, what was the alien ones? Uh, the, uh, oh, brood. the Brood. <laughs> the Brood went on for like five what, years. three years? Five years? Yeah. I don't remember. It was just forever. Yeah. Um, it, was two, uh, it was two issues. And it was, the plot is actually very similar. There's things that, that didn't happen. So we didn't actually have um, Wolverine going back. We had Kitty Pride going back. Um, but the idea was still the same. We need to go back and we need to fix this so this doesn't happen. Uh, I reread the comics. Didn't remember that they kind of left it up in the air and it actually didn't look like she succeeded. Yeah. It's a really um, dark and depressing storyline. And they've... Yeah. Of course, retconned it and redone it many, wow. many times over the decades. But back then, it was it was kind of unique. Yeah. In that it was dark and depressing and disturbingly believable in, within the continuity of the X Men. Yeah, especially that group of the X Men that time. That was yeah. the for a lot of people that was a very golden age period of the X Men. It was writer Chris Claremont teamed up with artist John Byrne and usually Terry Austin on inks. Um, they were doing the X Men. They started the new X Men in issue ninety four slash Giant Size One. That's where the whole new team, which included part of the, basically they got rid of the lame members of the old X Men. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and they got new cool characters. One of whom they killed off in like issue ninety five. Mm. Um, um, no, Warpath, not Warpath, uh, the Thunderbird. Yeah, Thunderbird. No. Um, and there were some really fun storylines. Dark Phoenix came out of that, which of course became one of the movies. This came out of it. Um, the whole uh, Hellfire Club th- plot line was really cool. 
And this is one of those plot lines, partially because it was so short in the comics, that was probably really easy, they thought, to adapt. And in some ways, I think they did a pretty good job. They took the heart of it, and they did the same thing. They, of course, gave us a happy ending. Or did they? No, Um, they did. Well, I have a theory about that. Uh Uh-oh, okay. So we see Logan... Basically, at the end of this battle, and we're skipping ahead a little bit, but at the end of this battle, Magneto, who's basically said, I have had enough. I am done. He lifts, I forget whatever it is, the the stadium that they play baseball in 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 DC, which actually they weren't at the time, but whatever. He lifts that into, he actually has been very smart. The Sentinels, if you can believe this, are made entirely without metal. How there's any power in them. I got one word for you, son. Plastics. (laughs) Yeah, because... Electricity travels real well in plastic. <laughs> yes, well, it's okay because tra- tells us they're made of space-age polymers, which explains everything. Yeah, no. So no. I go, no. Yeah. So he actually sneaks into the Sentinels before their big unveiling on the lawn of the White House, which, to be fair, at that point in time probably isn't that unlikely. That's long before it's like, we don't need anybody within a mile of the White House. And he basically takes metal from the train that they're being transported in and puts it all through their systems so that when it's time, he's going to be able to control them because he knows that otherwise he couldn't. He's seen the plans. Yeah. Good for him. I thought that was actually pretty smart. Yeah, here's my problem. That was a brilliant idea, and then he screws it up. All he had to do was stay undercover, let them start the demonstration, and then have it go horribly wrong. And everyone right. would have gone, Jesus, Trask guy's an idiot. We're never going to trust him. Forget this. Yeah. No, he shows up. Aha, I, Magneto, am here, and I'm doing stuff, and I'm bad. Look at this. I can throw stadiums around that I'm clearly exactly <laughs> as dangerous as Bolivar Trask. Sorry, Bolivar. Is, <laughs> has said I am. So you really should do this. Well, so when they first go to stop uh, Raven slash Mystique from killing Trask. That's they which botch is which it. is the Nexus moment, right? They botch it because basically instead of just her killing one guy, it's a giant mutant fight, which again proves their point. Um, but anyway, so at the end we have this big fight scene, which is actually very cool. And he takes all of these iron rebars and basically weaves them through Wolverine's body and then throws him to the bottom of the Potomac, where he is basically, for want of a better word, drowning. Yeah. (laughs) And he drowns. Or does he? My thought was, what if the very end, past the point in this film where we see see him drowning, is Owl Creek Bridge? Oh, so it's the moment it's the moment before death. Right. So he's like, I we did succeed. This is what really happens and he just convinces himself cuz literally everything uh, Jean Grey comes back. Uh everybody's happy. Mutants are accepted. There's cake for everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's cake. And so I was like cuz that's how they ended is with everything being cool. All the only one downside is that now Wolverine has to teach history, so you know, I guess. Yeah, that's a nice. It, that actually is a very interesting idea, except for the problem that Wolverine is functionally immortal, and he has drowned before, and he always comes back. Only if somebody pulls him up, and somebody does. Only in the Owl Creek Bridge part. Now, I'm not saying I'm right, but I was like, here's something that if I were a director and I didn't like the way things ended, that's how I'd fix it. <laughs> then I would at least uh, make make some hint of it, and. There isn't any. I mean, there's nothing dreamlike about the final sequence except that everything seems nice. Except it isn't perfect. Because while Phoenix is still there, so Scott Summers. And they're obviously <laughs> together. So she, <laughs> and I just like, like hey. your implication that there's no way it's a perfect world if Scott Summers is there. <laughs> well, because Wolverine's in love with Jean Grey, but, Scott, but she's obviously still with Scott Summers. If it was a dream, if it was an idealized world... You know, Scott either wouldn't be there or would be, I don't know, gay or would not be interested or had suffered some terrible accident where he became a eunuch. (laughs) He looked down one day. Oh, crap. Uh, (laughs) Special time of a young man's life and wasn't wearing his glasses like, what's going on? Oh, no! (laughs) There's a mutant moment for you folks. Yeah, Cyclops during puberty was probably not a lot of fun. Uh, Wait, maybe that explains why for the rest of his life he's like, yeah, whatever, all I've got are these stupid ruby (laughs) blasts. Life sucks, I hate everybody. (laughs) 
I said he lasered his own junk off. Okay. Because if you look up the word brood in the dictionary, you will in fact see a picture of Cyclops. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I like the idea. Honestly, I think your way would have made it better. I just don't think it works in the movie. There's no indication, nothing. Well, that it didn't. That it hasn't actually happened. Yeah. There's of course one other problem with that idea. Yeah. Well, then he doesn't live long enough to have come back to the past to have drowned in the Potomac. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But we're going to get to the time travel part because that's the fun yep. part. That's the um, fun part. But, uh, you know, the, the, the other actors, do you have any other actors that stood out for you? I have to say Quicksilver is the most fun thing in this movie. Isn't he? He is great. And I think the time in a bottle sequence yeah. is, the be- is the most fun scene. It's the high point of the movie. Remember we had a trivia question a while ago about what scene or actor saves a mo- or could save a movie. I think that scene is what makes that movie worth watching. You know the big downside of that scene? But he leaves after it. They d- they don't take him with them. Yeah, I know. I don't Okay. Uh from a logical point of view that's incredibly stupid. They should have said, "Hi, come with us. Look, I'm rich. I I have my own plane. I'll pay you a million dollars if you come with us." Yeah. Narratively, you can't have him along because he'd end, he'd fix everything. It's one of the problems with the super fast people in general. Yeah. It's like, er, here comes a fight and fight's over. Yeah. And you sit there and you try to, f- he's one of the mutants in this film where it's like, well, how would I defeat that? And it's like, I don't know. You have to get another speedster. It's the only yeah. way it ever works. But, you know, I want to say, you know, even in the Flash TV show, and I haven't watched it lately, I watched the first few seasons, and it was enjoyable, but the way they depict him doing the speed stuff, I don't think I've seen it done better. It was really cool. He's fun. Like, the character's fun. They first show up, and he's like pulling their wallets out to see who they are. He already looked at their rental agreement in the car, so he knows that they're not cops and stuff. Like, he just, he's done this stuff. He's been there. He's done it. And, but he's not as snotty a kid as he could be. He's just like, yeah, what it don't you're waste literally you're wasting my time. So yeah, w- that's get to the point. That's the other interesting thing that they touch on. Obviously the way he perceives the world is so different. Everything yeah. everyone around him to him is moving in slow motion. It probably drives him nuts. He literally he doesn't have attention deficit disorder, which is kind of hinted at. He's just he's literally perceiving time differently. Yeah. And we get to see him play ping pong with himself and just all this other stuff. He's a fun character. And he, he in, in he's a way, having a good time. Yeah. That's, he he's he's comfortable in his skin in a way that most of the other mutants kind of aren't. They really aren't. Yeah. And I, I just like little bits where the time in a bottle sequence, they're all about to be attacked by these guards in a kitchen, and he takes them all out in yep. absolutely gloriously photographed. I think that scene is the one that should have earned the Oscar. Yeah, I don't know if it did. And he's listening that on his Walkman. This this part I had a little problem with. To Jim Croce's time, if I could if I could keep time in a bottle, why is it playing in real time for him? It should be like if I. Well, Except all I can figure is it it's a field around his body. Well, the other thing too is that he knows that this is a problem, and when he wants to get to work, and we see him basically snap on the headphones like it's clobbering time. He may have just made a Walkman, which it's too early for a Walkman, but we won't talk about that, um, that just has a much faster motor uh, in it. Maybe so that's he can it. actually listen to stuff. But of course, I, I like the amount of the tape m- he would need, but whatever. Oh, boy. <laughs> but what I also like is, in the middle of it, he's just you know setting up all the guards, and he sees a guard, and he likes his hat, and he just takes the hat. I also like that he's having fun with them, and then at the last minute, he's like, oh, yeah, the bullets. I should do something yeah. about those. <laughs> and it's he doesn't a- do anything dangerous. He doesn't kill anybody. No. He, he, they got Quicks. Quicksilver has actually never been this fun in the comics. I always thought no. Quicksilver was kind of a pain in the neck, but whatever. Oh, seriously, seriously. Um, but yeah, he's a great character. He's a lot of fun. Um, I think that McAvoy and Fassbender do a great job as their they, characters. Yep, terrific. Um, of course, so does, you know, I'd, sadly, Ian McKellen doesn't get a lot to do, but Ian McKellen no. and, and Patrick Stewart just have that gravitas. Um, uh, we've got Hugh Jackman, who was born to be Wolverine. Yeah. It was his idea, apparently. So when he wakes up and gets out of bed with the young lady, he was supposed to be wearing boxer shorts. And he basically said, in Australia, if a young man wakes up in bed with a woman, he is not wearing boxer shorts. (laughs) But there you see somebody 
who is literally built like Wolverine. And yeah. He just, he does the cigar, he does everything. I can't think he of anybody it. better to play him. It's probably one of the best superhero castings. Yeah. But He's, this guy, Evan Peters, who plays Quicksilver, I think he was terrific. He I was. was really, I, sorry if this is a spoiler, but it's fun to see him show up in uh, WandaVision. Yeah. Uh, it's, he was so, a lot more interesting than the guy that got to play him in the Avengers movie. Who yeah. Was, I'm Quicksilver, gulp, die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and again, was much more like the one from the comic books in that he was like an arrogant jackass. Yeah. I, there is some things in this movie, before we get to the time travel, Yeah. Uh, I do like a lot of the, some of it, but they really overcomplicate the plot. The whole sequence in Vietnam. Yeah. I'm like, where did this come from? Because yeah. most of this takes place in Washington, D.C., as it should. That's fine. And then suddenly we're in Vietnam and Mystique has gone because there's a bunch of mutants serving over there because why haven't they made the mutants their own squad? Right. It's and like, also, hi, if, would you mind going and killing Ho Chi Minh, please? There. Good. You're done. Thank you. My name is Ho Chi Minh. Perhaps you've heard of my trail. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and honestly, the, here's the problem I have with that. If we have squads of mutants that are working for the army, um, why were we getting our asses handed to us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, although, because some because a private company came in and right. wanted to take them out for a study. Now, hey, that, and, answer this for me. Was that yeah. supposed to be the toad? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. That was the, yeah. One of them is a toad. One of them is havoc, and a bunch of them are people. I have no idea who they were. Okay. I think they made them up. I could be wrong. But, but also, these are some pretty powerful mutants. These aren't like, you know, the guy, like, Beak, who <laughs> basically looks kind of like a bird but can't fly. Ah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's like, why weren't you guys just using them as the spearhead? You could have won the war in a couple of days. Yeah. It's, it's like the Watchmen with Dr. Manhattan. Like, hi, I'm here. War's over. <laughs> I think the thing, though, is, is they... In their defense, I think they were trying to show more about Stryker, who will eventually yeah. be a big part, or was, I can't remember when they showed Wolverine's origin, but whatever, yeah. it was a big deal with Wolverine's origin. Of course, that becomes a slight, tiny little plot point unnecessarily yeah. later in the film. But it also could be the way that they're trying to show that uh, the evil ways that uh, Trask is trying to use these people as he doesn't yeah. consider them people, okay. but we don't need it. Um, no, we, we then, don't. Of it's, course, a, it's unnecessary. It does, however, allow us a reason for seeing Toad as a fry cook. Because <laughs> that yep. is a thing. Yeah. Sure, that, that makes sense. Again, Jennifer Lawrence, I think, is terrific as Mystique. Yep. She actually, because I, I, I'm sorry, in the first X-Men movies, Rebecca Romaine, she's fine. She looks great in blue body makeup. But Mystique had, like, no personality apart from being slightly grumpy. Yeah. In this... In in this in in first class, she's really interesting. She yeah. you can you can understand a lot more of her motivation. She's she does so much just with facial expressions, and that's the other problem is she's kind of a pivot point because it isn't just that okay she kills uh, Trask and that kicks off the Sentinel program, but she gets captured right and they use her DNA which they were not doing a lot of in 73. They knew about DNA, but I, eh. it, wasn't, it wasn't the magic juice it became in later movies. Giant to robots make, for that metal. Yeah, to, uh, make, yes, to make Sentinels that could instantly adapt to mutant power. She's the key to it. Which also, which brings, which again, over, then uh, the plot complication, Magneto decides, ah, so what you're saying is we should kill her. Yeah. You know, and... Xavier is, and Wolverine are both going, no, that is in fact 100% what we're not saying. It's like, got it, I'll go kill her. Well, now, here's the thing again. I like what they do with Magneto because, again, while you don't agree with him, you understand where he's coming from. He's like, look, Charles, they're never going to accept us as people. They're just not. Look at every evidence, everything that's happened. Also, you say I abandon us. It was you who actually abandoned the rest yeah, of the that's kind, actually which is a, true. Yeah, that confrontation is actually very well done. And he's because oh, Xavier is screaming at him, you left me, you know, after you crippled me and And left Raven. And left Raven. And she and, left and, me. She had yeah, Raven left him. And he was going, What are you talking about? I was out fighting for our people. We really could have used you. You abandoned us. Yeah. And that's 
it's a really interesting dichotomy because you've got a much more practical, grounded Magneto going, look, this is the way stuff actually is. And you've got, uh, I almost said Picard. <laughs> you've got <laughs> Xavier, Javier, whatever you're supposed to pronounce. I uh, guess it has yeah. to be Xavier because otherwise it wouldn't be well, Professor X. Everyone X-A's. pronounces it Xavier, which yeah. is wrong, but whatever. Yeah. But we have Professor X who's got the much more like perfect world and he's it's, an idealist, a utopianist. Is. And honestly, it actually echoes to, this is why I almost said Picard, it almost echoes towards Star Trek's ideals, which is, this is where we need to get to. And so you've got these two opposite ends, one of which is, this is how they are, and this is what we need to get to. And they're trying to come together to basically do the two things together. It's like, all right, if this is the way things are, how do we get to this? And the moment where they're working together... And, and it looks like Magneto is like, okay, let's try it your way, which is, to be fair, a lot more than Charles is doing. Yeah. Uh, you can kind of see what this trying to go on. And then, of course, stuff goes to hell. And and Magneto's like, I did this. I'm not doing it again. There's too many of us have died. He's got a point. Um, and then, but still, so does Charles, because it's like, yeah, but if we keep doing the same thing, we're never going to change. And people are never going to change. So it's actually... There's some really good stuff going on here. And quite yeah. honestly, very X-Men stuff. Yeah, very X-Men. So. Uh, um, uh, I think we need to get to the time travel. I was going to say, but unfortunately, in the middle of this, we have some time travel. Uh, yeah. So let's get to our talking points, uh, which will lead mm. to other things. Uh, Max, is this yeah. a good use of time travel? Uh, yeah, I think it is. It's trying to avoid the end of the world. It's trying to avoid... You know, a dystopian apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Some of the end, not just of mutant kind, but the subjugation of humanity. We see a future that is a horror show. Right. And they're attempting to, to use time travel. And by the way, they're trying to use, they use it in a fairly, in a different sort of way, because they aren't transporting anything physical. They transport consciousness. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it's a good use. Do you? I really liked that idea. Uh I mean, you could argue whether or not it makes sense, but it actually puts a really cool limitation on time travel. So you can't go back to the beginning of time. You can only go f- back as far as the person you're sending was born mm-hmm. and, you know, active. So Wolverine, thankfully, being as old as he was, was a good choice in this case. Mm-hmm. But it's a nice limitation. Um, we won't talk about the, oh, if I have bad feelings, I might launch myself back to the future uh, just yet yeah. we're, we're gonna get there but i liked that idea again i think if you examine it a little further in it doesn't necessarily make sense because of course as soon as you do that as with any time travel perhaps more so if you're in the consciousness of a person it means that the future as they're coming back couldn't have happened because yeah. they would have remembered the ah, blah, 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 blah. but I like the idea and I like the limitation in a gaming sense it's a great limitation <laughs> yeah does time travel make for a cohesive plot now I'm not sure we can blame the time travel on the fact that there isn't a cohesive plot <laughs> because the plot just tries to do too many things Okay, they try to shove an awful lot in here because they're not just they're not just using the plot of days of future past they're they're grafting on all this stuff about exploitation of mutants uh in in Vietnam exploitation of mutants for research all the political stuff with Trask and Congress you know Trask isn't in days of future past in the in, in the story he doesn't no. show up I don't think he it, existed then did he he did. Uh, okay. I don't remember if it was Bolivar. Or the, there are a couple of Trasks because, <laughs> yeah, Bolivar gets killed off because of his name, and <laughs> his son takes over. As far as I know, his name's I don't know Irving or something. Just. You mean Burving or Bedmond, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> now, apparently, Bolivar is actually a real name. Oh, just, I'm, it has great. It has thankfully disappeared from. I'm deeply sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and our apologies go out to anyone out there who's actually still named Bolivar. Um, I think they tried to stick on too much. Okay, uh, and I don't, but I don't think the time travel was the problem, except it is a little weird. Or is, I don't know, is it weird that he ha- that it's he gets in effect psychic feedback when he gets really upset, like when he sees Major Stryker, the guy who he knows is going to. Uh, <laughs> 
you torture mean major him. Stress. <laughs> hey, what? Major stress. Major stress. Major stress. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'm going to actually, before I answer that, I'm going to actually tie it in with the next question because this is okay. where I'm going to probably rant. So the question I asked Matt was, does time, does time travel make for a case of plot? And the next question is, does time travel make sense in this story? Okay. Yeah. For those who don't know, and that's everybody except for maybe one person, I used to have a YouTube channel called The Movie Wrench. This is a Voice of Max and Movie Wrench co-production. Yes, it is. And one of the films, and what I used to do is I used to look at films and try to find films that drove me nuts and try to fix them. This was one of those films. If they had stayed with the idea, they send Wolverine back to fix things. And for most of the film, they do this. We are in 1973 and we see all the X-Men fights in Oliver, I'm sorry, Bolivar Trask. Yeah. Oliver. Uh, we, <laughs> the Sentinels, all that stuff, and Magneto getting out of prison and Quicksilver. If we had stuck with that, I probably would have been fine. The problem is they decided there wasn't enough, and by they I mean Brian Singer, decided there wasn't enough tension and we had to have this thing where somehow, even though we're in the future, the past has to catch up to us, that it's happening at the same time. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. When, as soon as Wolverine was sent back in time, he was either successful or he failed, at which point the future stays the same or it changes. That's yeah. it. The end. None of this, oh no, the robots are coming in, we get to watch the X-Men get killed. We have to hold them off until he's finished in the path. It's a little too much like the that watch, as long as that watch keeps running, you know, it, that run, it's real time in San Dimas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, uh, the Bill and Ted syndrome, that's what this film. Yeah. No, it, you're right, it should have been over the second he went back. Like if you At least in the perception of the, of the future people. Like, I would have cut out everything that had to do with the them guarding Wolverine and them being attacked, except maybe at the you could have shown a scene where the robots, it's like, the Sentinels are here, and they're shooting, and then, because we know he was successful, it all goes away. But yeah, the which whole, is what happens at the end. But the whole added, was, oh, we have to keep Wolverine going, because blah, blah, no. Once he was back, that's it, we're done. He's He's been there, he's done it. It's the past does time. To, yeah. Unless you're watching the arrival time does not all happen at the same point. And the arrival is actually a really cool film and it has it an is. Avenger in it. Yep. Uh, so well, sort of, I, I, okay. Sporting I've got a salesman. bow and arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jeremy Renner. I actually yeah. like Jeremy Renner. Oh, he's terrific. But anyway, uh, but, but Hawkeye is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that part of the film really just annoyed the crap out of me because it's like you're having your cake, eating it too, and it came back again. No, 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 no. The idea of sending Wolverine back to fix the past, the reason they're sending Wolverine back to fix the past, fine. I got no yeah. problem with that. Even the method. Even the method, I think, is well, at least interesting. It's a different yeah. way, and it takes care of that pesky spatial problem that we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And also the idea that you could go up and down your own personal timeline is kind of interesting. You could do a lot of stuff with that. That's pretty cool. But no. Um, and also we'll talk about how not 1973 this is. <laughs> the hey, thing we start off, we got a water bed, we got a lava lamp. It's totally 1973. And there's reruns of Star Trek, yes, and, yeah. and it just and happens Sanford to be an episode with time travel in it, although, to be fair, it's Star Trek, and, um, yeah. yeah. Can't, can't did, uh, swing a dead cat, you'll hit a time travel plot. Um, as much as I love Star Trek. So, if they had left out most of the future parts... I would have been a lot happier. But that whole explanation of, oh, well, the future, the past doesn't happen until the observer. I'm sorry that you're basically saying the universe doesn't happen unless Wolverine sees it. I don't buy your explanation, Mr. Singer. No, 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 no. Uh, the last question is the idea of paradox addressed. Uh, not at all. Nope. <laughs> not even a little. Because you have no Wolverine is back in 1973 with all his knowledge of what happens between 1973 and future. Yeah. Uh, I would assume he's off buying Apple stock at a nickel. And <laughs> it, it, it literally can't work, no. sadly. Because if he comes back, 
his being successful mean he never came back, so he doesn't have memories of the future, and it just uh. it becomes this loop that just no doesn't go anywhere. I mean, little things I wondered about, like, oh, okay, so he's pulled out of the river, and it looks like it's by Major Stryker. Stress. <laughs> Yeah, major stress, and uh, it's like, ah, okay, that's when he, they get him and put the adamantium in, into him, because he doesn't have that. when he should, In 1973, he just had his bone claws and his ordinary skeleton. Right. Yeah, except we find out, I think through a nicely bit of, nice bit of subtle camera work, that it's Mystique. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, does that mean in the future he doesn't have the adamantium skeleton? And Because we don't see him. We don't no. see him pop his claws. No. So we don't know, and it's like, if he didn't, wouldn't that change an awful lot? And and clearly it has, because when he goes home to to his present, uh, starts future. to hurt. Future, <laughs> present, pluperfect, past tense, whatever. <laughs> yeah, diagram that sentence. Clearly, like, he's, he's the same age, so obviously it is, what, 50 years after the Sentinels. Sure. Tw- yeah, whatever. And by the way, nobody else has gotten any older, apparently. Shh. Yeah. And as you say, Jean Grey is there, meaning the whole Phoenix stuff just flat out didn't happen. Yeah. Which okay. really didn't have anything to do with the Sentinels, but okay. Yeah, but it means the whole. And again, he has no idea what has happened between 1973 and his present. Right. As he points out, when. Professor X says, don't you have a history class to teach? And he's basically saying, I am completely unqualified because <laughs> I don't know any history for the last 50 or some odd years. Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah, is, it's a problem. That this, part, the time travel in this is a problem. This is one of the reasons we did this series because we have yet to be proven wrong that time travel in essence doesn't work. But uh, do you have any more uh, notes you wanted to get to that are outside the uh, time travel questions before we hit our ending part? I still have a problem with Magneto dropping a stadium around uh, the White House. Because, let's see, you're going to encase the building in a structure that has, by its nature, like 50 different exits. Well, and luckily the little um, hidey hole is in a box right below the center of the White House. Yeah, so which I'm not, pretty not, sure. The... Not like off-site somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also want to say that is like one of the worst versions of we because they don't they don't do what they usually do in in movies, which is you know say oh this is President you know Sparky or yeah. some made up guy. No, it's supposed to be President Nixon. Yeah, and uh, that is one of the worst renditions of Nixon <laughs> I've ever seen. However, I do have to say he probably would have welcomed. This whole mutant thing, because it's 1973, he's right in the middle of Watergate. He would have loved a distraction. Yeah, and I was thinking, too, that um, if this had been Nixon, the likelihood of his doing anything that big or noteworthy or risky was probably next to nothing. Say what you want about him. He could be very cautious, and he didn't take, he usually didn't take chances like that. Which is one of the other reasons I was like, this is not 1973. Yeah. He, he was out, like the beginning of 1974, he was out. So he was well already suspected at this point. And of course, Vietnam, they didn't even talk about the fact that, you know, oh, we see soldiers in Vietnam. We don't see anybody acting like they ever, they knew what Vietnam was like, either to have been there or back home. Because yeah. the protests by then were, were everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, but shall we uh, yeah, wrap up? Yeah, I think we can hit the wrap up. Round up. So, Mike. Oh, <laughs> defeated. <laughs> now, I assume you saw this movie when it came out. Oh, yes. Oh, In yes. I made a whole video about this. <laughs> yes, you did. And by the way, these are st- his videos, the movie wrench, are still on YouTube, and you should give them a look. They really are a lot of fun. And he brings up some really interesting points. Just uh, look for the movie wrench on YouTube. Yeah. But so, what did you think of this movie? All right. Well, I obviously disliked it enough when it came out that I made this long ranting video about it. And I have not watched this movie since. And I almost, almost decided, you know, I've done enough with this movie. I don't need to watch it again. I'm just going to cheat. But I didn't. And I'm actually glad that I didn't cheat because, and I, for a second, I th- thought that they actually had made a director, not director's cut, a fan cut or something where they had cut out all those parts that drove me nuts. Because for the rest of it, I actually pretty much liked it. 
Like, I thought it was very X-Men. Yeah. I love the two sides that both had points. Neither one of them was was totally right. Professor X is like, you can sit there and be in high and mighty all you want, but that's not going to do anything for us right now. And with Magneto, it's like, yeah, you're a defeatist. I get it. I understand why you are where you are, but you're just basically damning yourself to repeat this ad infinitum. Uh, we see some characters that, quite honestly, would have been cool to see had we known who they were. <laughs> yeah. um, I never understood what Bishop was all about, and we certainly don't learn anything except he's black and he has a gun. Okay. Um, the people we do know we barely see, like Storm, which, okay, she's pregnant, I get it. Um, Mystique is given a lot more to do. She's a lot cooler. She's also yeah. one of those characters like, um, if I don't have this Mystique detector, um, how, how do we defeat her again? Yeah. Uh, guys? Yeah. Oh, it is you. <laughs> Uh, I think, again, I think, um, Trask is played really well. They don't do anything with his height, which is great. I'm glad they don't. I wish they do that more often. Um, we get to see X-Men stuff. We get to see the Sentinels, which admittedly they, they don't make sense yeah. as an X-Men fan fan made me kind of go squee. There's actually Sentinels. <laughs> um, I actually liked it a lot more than I did before. It's just they should not have done the stuff in the future where we get to see it happening at the same time because it's just dumb. There are problems. It's not perfect. But for an X-Men film, except for that, I actually thought it was pretty good, believe it or not. What about you? Um, I'm, I, I even like the, uh, the future stuff. Uh, although I do get it, especially that's really just there for the comic book fans. Yeah. That's for, that's really there for, oh, look, they included fill in the blank. <laughs> and which one was he? <laughs> uh, you know, he was the guy over there named Phil. Um, oh. he was the guy who did the thing that time. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't think that I would normally say, I think this is one of the weaker X-Men movies, but then I remember what came out after it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Again, I it was at some. I really like everybody they got playing Magneto and Professor X, mm -hmm. Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen. I, to see them all in the same movie is really cool. Again, we got nothing from Ian McKellen, but we actually I like that that time travel dialogue between Stewart and McAvoy, and in fact, Professor X talking to himself. I thought that was really touching and very moving. It was a cool scene. It just doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Mm. But it, was, it I, I think it's a lot of fun. And as you say, it is so X-Men, right down to the arguing. Yeah. It, it really is. And again, <laughs> Quicksilver's the best thing in there. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sorry they didn't do more with him in that because it's just perfect. Just yeah. the amount and the this, that one scene, and they try to do it again in Apocalypse, and it's just like, no. Yeah. They even picked a stupider song for some reason. Mm -hmm. He's doing Sweet Dreams. That has nothing to do with what with time and space. But mm -hmm. anyway, I think it's flawed, but it's entertaining. Yeah. I yes, and my if you watch the video on that that I did on the on the movie Wrench, I am a lot nastier to the film because it's just like it's my the whole thing is i'm trying to fix the film and i think one of the things that was so frustrating is i ended up liking most of the film it was just like if you would just do this thing this would have been a lot more fun um i, I will say too as far as x-men comics of the era goes this film wasn't nearly talky enough <laughs> <laughs> no no the monologues <laughs> didn't go on nearly long enough but there's a lot chris claremont was not known for his brevity no and the, sadly, the most X-Men fight scenes are not X-Men. They're New Mutants and other people and stuff. And those are the yeah. future scenes. When they're working together, when the X-Men are mm. at best, you got chills watching them fight because it's like, hey, there's a fastball special. Hey, there's yeah. this. Hey, there's that. But the X-Men would be doing things in combination that you're just like, what? 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 How, how do mm. we? Do? Oh. Even if they showed them being beaten by, like they do in the comic version of this, being beaten by the brother, I'm sorry, Los uh, Malos Mutantes, um, <laughs> at first, you see them come together. It's like, wait, remember our training? And they do these cool things together. That was the whole point of the X-Men is that they work really well as a team. 
Um, so you do get some of that, just not enough because it's in 1973 and we have to see Wolverine's ass, which was not my least favorite part of the film. Uh, anyway, uh, that's what we've got. Uh, let's not forget about our trivia question, though. Yes, our trivia question, our poll question. Poll question. Yep. And this week we would like to know from you, our listeners, what film do you wish had been really a TV show instead? A nice, long, mini-seasoned Game of Thrones-like TV show. To answer us, you have a number of ways of doing so. The first of which is head on over to our website. If you haven't been there in a while, guess what? Uh, it's the same except with more It's still episodes. there. Yeah. Yep. MaxMikeMovies.com, where you can leave comments. We actually get comments there. We do take your suggestions for both poll questions and show ideas. Um, you can email us directly. We've had a couple of those lately. That's us at MaxMikeMovies.com. If you have a pad... Padcast, Padcast, Kudkas, Bluvla, Pad tie. that thing. If you have a podcast app of your choice, we're probably on it somewhere. And last but not least, there is social media, at least if you're doing Twitter or uh, Facebook, at which we are both Max Mike Movies. And did hey, you mention the email address? I did. You get sex tuple bumpy bucks if you leave a Twitter comment. <laughs> Uh, uh, sex uh, <laughs> you said sex <laughs> i did <laughs> but yeah so that's our mm. poll question so max you i have a poll question for you we got two films left in this here series and yours is the next one up what film will max pick wait i'm using my time travel boop, 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 boop. oh it's a trout. Oop, sorry, wrong <laughs> That's power. right. We're going to be watching a trout. <laughs> what film are we going to watch next week, my fishy friend? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's called Trout in the Time Stream. Ah. And it's a fascinating story. Of, oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. No, it's not a trout. It's even better. It's Tom Cruise. It's Wait, I'm sorry. How is Tom Cruise better than a trout? <laughs> because he tastes better when cooked with lemon and butter. I don't agree. <laughs> Well, when was the last time you tried it? Anyway, <laughs> we are going to be watching uh, the the many titled movie Edge of Tomorrow, which was, was also named something like Lather, Rinse, Repeat. I thought it was something. Kill, Die, Repeat or something. Something like that. It, it went through a couple of different names, but it's uh, Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, and it's basically time travel as and through war. I think if I remember correctly, the highlight of the film is you get to see Tom Cruise killed over and over and over again. I'm being cruel. That is, that, that is the clip reel that I have. Yes, <laughs> that is in fact my screensaver. But yes, we are going to see, this is another fairly, well, fairly recent uh, uh, foray into the field of time travel. So before Edge next week, join tomorrow. us again for <laughs> Rinse, Rather, Repeat. <laughs> yes, and we will have seen you next time. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench.